and welcome back to Cooking with Books with me, Julie Smith, the podcast which tells the stories behind the food, linking what we eat to who we are and where we come from. And this week I'm in Florence with Australian Japanese food writer Emiko Davies, who's made Tuscany her home. It absolutely fascinated me um, living in Florence. You know, one of the first things I did was go around the city and eat my way through every trattoria. And the funny thing is that um, every trattoria has essentially the exact same menu. And so you go from one place to the other, you order the exact same things, the same side dishes, the same first courses, the same, the same everything. Emiko and I first met on the Delicious podcast to talk about her first book back in 2018, Tortellini at Midnight, in which she explores her adopted country through the wonderful story of her Italian husband's family. In her latest book, Torta della Nonna, she digs her spoon deeper into the history of the family, but also of Florence to find its sweet spots. But I asked her to remind us of that delicious love story that first inspired her deep interest in Italian cooking. So Tortellini at Midnight was um, sort of an excuse to reminisce and um, research my husband's family history. And um, one of the stories, one of the family stories that inspired really the the whole book comes from um, my husband's great-grandmother, who was a noblewoman in um, Puglia. And it was, it really starts with her meeting, um, her future husband who happened to be the postman. And, um, and a particularly fateful day when she happened to answer the door to this postman. <laughs> and, um, they, uh, kept meeting this way, <laughs> her answering the door mm-hmm. and, um, him coming by until her mother realised that something was going on and threatened to um, disown her from the family if she continued, um, you know, flirting with the postman, Um, to which her response was to run away from home. So she left and um, and eloped with the postman. Um, His name was Nicola and her name was Anna. And they ended up having eight children <laughs> and they moved from um, from southern Italy. They moved all the way from Taranto to Torino, um, the very northern part of, of Italy. It would have been this. This was just after World War One. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it would have been like moving countries, yeah. really, from, you know, going from Puglia to, to Piemonte. And then they they settled there and and um, lived out the rest of their lives in Torino. And then one of their children, Mario, who is my husband's grandfather, he met Lena. One summer, she spent a whole summer visiting her cousins in Torino from Tuscany. And she met Mario and they, they fell in love and um, ended up getting married and then moving moving to Tuscany um, during the Second World War. So this is um, kind of a, a trip around Italy, really, because it starts in um, Puglia goes to <laughs> northern Italy, um, but then the family end up in Tuscany, where uh, where they settle and um, and they never they never go back to Torino or uh, to Puglia. So my mother in law, so Mario and Lina are her parents. She's never even visited Puglia before. She's never been to Puglia, which is extraordinary because I mean the the story that you tell that it, it's so extraordinary because people didn't really travel away from their area, particularly in that time. But in Italy, you know, each of these districts is very self contained. It has its own culture and it has its own food. So your map of of the country through this fantastic love story, you know, bumps into lots of different types of food. So, of course, she wouldn't have, have been down to Puglia or to Torino. Um, but but presumably, you know, we can taste that journey through through these extraordinary recipes that you bring. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, the really funny um, things about this, I mean, funny to me now, to, to all of us now, really, um, is how regional this food was. And so, for example, my mother-in-law, who's never been to Puglia, she grew up um, tasting her grandmother's food and eating the food that her mother cooked that she learned from her mother-in-law. So um, there's this dish of polpette, 
um, which are a really classic dish. If you go to Puglia, you will you'll almost definitely be served these delicious polpette meatballs in a in a tomato sauce. They usually eat them as antipasto. And this was the dish that my mother in law in her in her family. This was the dish that they made for when they had guests over because it was like something so exotic and so different so different from Tuscan food, you know, and the Tuscan guests that were coming over, they had never tasted these polpette. They had never tasted um, parmigiana, you know, eggplant parmigiana. They'd never tasted that, uh, that dish before. And so she would take these things to picnics with friends or to parties or invite people over and have them. And this was like the first time anyone in her circle of friends or, um, at the, she used to teach in a school so she would often bring these to like meetings and things and nobody knew what these dishes were sometimes they would go untouched because they were not sure what is that what is that vegetable I've never seen it before and um you know a tray of eggplants would just be untouched because oh, how people didn't know what it was and she must have seemed very exotic to them yeah it would have been really really quite it's different speaking a different <laughs> yes. language isn't it yeah. it's extraordinary yeah. so you're, I mean, you come from a different place altogether. You come from Sydney, um, but your mother is Japanese. So you're used to this exoticism, this bringing together of lots of different cultures. I mean, how much of a shock was it to come to a place where, which is very traditional, very regional, very stuck in its ways? It, um, it absolutely fascinated me um, living in Florence. Coming, I've, I've been here now since 2005. And, uh, you know, one of the first things I did was go around the city and eat my way through every trattoria. And the funny thing is that um, every trattoria has essentially the exact same menu. And so you go from one place to the other, you order the exact same things, the same <laughs> side dishes, the same first courses, the same the same everything. And after a while, that, that really struck me how... These these are these are all the same menu, and then you know I, I got to know my husband or other Italian friends, and when I would go to their houses or be invited to be cooked by their grandmothers or their mothers, those dishes were exactly the same things too. And I realised <laughs> when course. you go out to eat in Florence, you're not going out like in Australia. You go out to, and you would order something completely different that you wouldn't cook at home, right? That's sort of half the point of going out to eat. Yeah. But in Florence, you go out to eat the exact same thing your mother and your grandmother cooks <laughs> and compare <laughs> notes and talk about it. And, um, and that really, really struck me. I just, I found that endlessly fascinating. And that's what made me want to sort of delve into regional Tuscan food, regional Italian food in general. But, you know, even just in Florence, um, delve into that food and that history and why hasn't this changed why does everyone still want to go out and eat the same food it's and, fascinating and did you find the answer well I, I mean in a in a way I did when I was writing Florentine um, my first book which is dedicated exactly to that um, that topic all of the really typical the really classic Florentine dishes um, I did sort of discover that it is it is very much like Florence itself Florence is essentially unchanged from the Middle Ages. Um, the buildings that are still there, the, the shape of the streets are still there. Uh, and then you, you, get, you get to the Renaissance and then you've got, you know, all of the buildings and the churches and the artworks that um, the city that, you know, make Florence what it is. Even today, this is what Flor people come to visit Florence for. They're still there. They're still unchanged. In a way, um, the cuisine is very much like that as well. Um, you know, you, you don't come to Florence to see like innovative, <laughs> you know, you know, sort of things. You, you come to Florence to appreciate the the history. Perfection. The perfection. Is, it, is it about perfection? I think it's about uh, perfection would be more in terms of, I think, in the art and the architecture with the food. The food is much more rustic, but it is sort of reassuring it's reassuring that it's always there it's always the same thing that the, the trattoria that you love and you go to is serving the same menu as it did in the 50s um or if not if not a lot earlier than that and um there's something very very reassuring about that and i think with tuscan food especially which is so 
Um, it is it is rustic. It is very simple. It relies heavily on the season and just on really really good ingredients. It's very simple. You know, it's unadorned and it doesn't have lots of you know fancy sauces or anything like that. It's it it is sort of it, it is what it is, and there's no need to change it. You know, it's good. But it's interesting, isn't it? So yeah, if it if it ain't broke, it's, don't exactly. fix it. In one sense, but you know, I always associate Italian food, particularly Italian food that has been. Uh, exported with its people from the old country to somewhere like Australia, for example. You know, Melbourne has wonderful Italian food, um, but and and also to America because the food and identity it goes in hand in hand. And almost you're you're cooking up. I'm I'm, I'm constantly interviewing people who have fled generally for economic or political reasons, and they cling on to the food from the the motherland. You know, with some kind of tenacity to, to 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 try and remind themselves of who they were they are but the florentines haven't even left home yes that's something really interesting the tuscans have never had to let's say they haven't had to leave their home um like for example southern italians many many southern italians have completely evacuated their towns there are towns that mm. you go to or they're, they're ghost towns now there are no young people living in them there's not mm. even middle-aged people living in them and mm. um and also in northern italy there was a shift as well but but tuscany i think the tuscans are very very deeply rooted in their land and their place they don't move they might leave for a little bit but they always come back and they don't move <laughs> and historically they haven't either you don't really find like this sort of exodus of tuscans looking for a better place to live they they are there yeah. they love tuscany they love they've got their roots there and um it's really hard to find them um, spread about like southern Italians, for example. Fascinating, There's, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, maybe because they didn't need to. Um, maybe they didn't the, need to or want to. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I mean, your one of your big passions is historic cookbooks, and you particularly use the Pellegrino Artusi uh, yes. book, which eighteen ninety one. Yeah, and yes. and that was the book that was given to brides uh, when they were married as sort of you know this is how you become the perfect woman this is what we need you to do is that still the thing is the woman still required to cook perfectly these extraordinary traditional recipes mm, no I, w I mean i would say no no longer anymore um even i would argue that even my mother-in-law's generation has um has almost is not not necessarily in that same um in that same category anymore. It was definitely for um, for Lena, Marco's grandmother. That was definitely the thing that was still done. And she was, Lena, for example, was a really great cook. And everyone in the family, I never got to meet her. She passed away two months before I met Marco. But mm -hmm. everyone in the family always talks about what a great cook Lena was. People reminisce about her food. Marco's friends from, from primary school um, used to invite themselves over when they knew she was cooking <laughs> and, um, and when, you know, invite, just invite themselves over and to stay for dinner. And um, they still talk about that to this day. So she was a really great cook, but she also, um, you know, had a very long reign in the kitchen and she taught a lot of things to Marco's aunt, who uh, is about 10 years older than my mother-in-law. And um, that was her daughter-in-law. And so she she then inherited a lot of these recipes and learned how to cook from Lena. Whereas my mother-in-law, Angela, was sort of standing on the sidelines watching, but she was only allowed to grate the cheese. So <laughs> she didn't have the sort of kitchen skills that uh, – well, she wasn't allowed the sort of kitchen skills that, um, that her sister-in-law, her older sister-in-law, was able to, to well, learn from her mother. Why not allowed? Well, I think she, I think because Lena was a little, um, I want to, I mean, she may have been a bit of a perfectionist, perfectionist oh. in the kitchen, oh. and she wanted to do all of the cooking. Okay. Up until she was um, so so frail, she was still guiding. Um, you know, she was still in the kitchen, really telling people what to do, 
grate it like this. You've missed a bit there. You've still got to stir this pot a bit longer, you know. So even when she couldn't physically stand there and, and hold the spoon, she was still directing everybody in the kitchen <laughs> to cook things the way that she wanted them to. Um, but then, you know, I see people like my mother-in-law and my, my sister-in-law, they, they don't have those same skills that Lena did, that Franca, the, the, um, the daughter-in-law did. And I think there's something that was sort of missing. They didn't get to experience that cooking maybe in the kitchen. They don't follow the cookbooks. My mother-in-law has a recipe book that she scribbles things down in and maybe her friends give her recipes or she sees something on TV, she'll scribble it down. But she doesn't look at cookbooks like um, Lena did, look at cookbooks and follow them through. Um, and it's just really interesting to see to see that. I don't think that women today are really cooking as much, but they, they also aren't expected to mm. either. Yeah. So what are you finding from these historic cookbooks? Do you think that, you know, as a outsider, as a foreigner, you know, on so many levels, um, were you sort of trying to kind of channel the spirit of the great Artusi to, to help you find your way into the kitchen and then channeling the spirits of, of your family, your new family to, to, to really learn how to do it incredibly well? Well, when I first started cooking from Artuzi, I was really curious to know if the if the recipes were those same recipes that you're you know that you eat when you go to Florence. I mean, Artuzi was from Emilia Romagna, but he lived in Florence for um, many, many, many years um, for most of his life. And when he wrote the book, he was living in Florence. So there are a lot of dishes that are definitely, definitely Florentine or um, Tuscan-based dishes, and. Um, so it was really at first a curiosity to know, do they, do they come out the same? Do, are they the same, you know, taste and flavor? And um, so I started cooking them and I was amazed. They were <laughs> more or less exactly the same <laughs> as what you eat when you go out to the Trattoria. So in a way that was very um that was a very useful way to learn how to cook the really traditional dishes. I mean, these are, are dishes that have, you know, been plucked right out of 1891 so mm. you know they were um, essentially unchanged and very interesting for me to see how the flavors or maybe the, the even the way things were being cooked hadn't changed um, either mm -hmm. and so I think that was a really good way to sort of learn about um, Tuscan food and learn about sort of look into why why it's done this way oh this works so i'm not going to change it you know that's yeah, yeah and and what maybe in some some smaller cases why things may have changed but in general um in general most of the dishes are really 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 very much the same way that they would be treated yeah. um today well, let's learn some of them um take us through your full food moments um you're gonna have to pronounce all these <laughs> i have a clue <laughs> schiacciata so, aluva aluva so schiacciata aluva is um, so in Tuscany, schiacciata is a is basically a focaccia, and um, it's like um, so it's a plain bread dough. Tuscan bread is famously unsalted, so this one, although it's not sweet, it doesn't have a lot of salt like you would think of like a salty focaccia. Um, and instead, you've got grapes on there, and these are wine grapes. They're always made in September and maybe into October. But you would never find this, let's say, February or May. You know, you would only find it during the grape harvest season. Mm. And that's because that's when it was born. You know, it was a way of using up extra excess, extra grapes, um, throw them into a focaccia. And this is a this is a recipe that comes from around the Chianti. So, um, you know, an area that's very famous for its vineyards. And, um, and again, because it like Florence is still... I mean, I would say I'm talking all of Italy really is still very much dependent on the seasons. The cuisine is guided completely by the seasons. Um, this is something that you, you you would never, you know, it would be like blasphemous to see it in a in a different season. It's always the symbol of, um, you know, the end of summer and the beginning of autumn. And I look forward all year to eating this and it's worth the wait. You're waiting all until September before you get this like bite of schiacciata aluva. And I think something to do with the wine grapes, um, 
they're not as sweet as table grapes and they have you know a little bit of acidity to them so even though it is like a sweet dish it shouldn't be like cloyingly sweet and it should have the crunch of um, grape seeds in it which is kind of strange maybe the first time you've had it (laughs) but then you realize oh these are edible after all and and there is something quite nice about crunching into grape seeds and 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 stained purple of course from the from the grapes very purple and that's something that's i i really love about um you know seeing these these schiacciata l'uva in Florence in the bakeries you'll you'll see them like very very stained purple which is lovely if you try making this with table grapes it doesn't quite have the same effect it's yeah. got to be got to yeah. be wine grapes <laughs> interesting I mean because you the, the second food moment uses the alchemies uh, the yes. scarlet tinged alcohol which you say yes. is the elixir of life tell us about this this is totally di nonno Mario yeah yeah, and the torta di nonno Mario is a, is like a, a sort of a sponge cake that is stained pink with alchemas. And alchemas is a is a Tuscan liqueur. It was invented around the time around the Renaissance um, during the Medici's reign, and it's basically um, a really aromatic liqueur. It's very sweet, and it's got lots and lots of spices in it. And it used to be drank as an elixir. It was something that you would give um, people recovering from a sickness or um, like women who'd just given birth. <laughs> you would give them a shot of alchemist. <laughs> and it's stained pink with cochineal insects, um, which is, of course, like a, the natural red food mm. dye. And... Um, and it's still used today, but nobody drinks it just just straight today. It's almost always used for um, dessert making, and it gives gives this beautiful bright pink or light pink color, depending on how much of it you want to use. That's good for you. And yeah, well, they say you know it used to used to it was a great pick me up. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And this is absolutely shot through with stories of your of your family as well. So it's even uh, called different things by. The different members of your family. So there's the wobbly cake that your mother-in-law <laughs> Angela calls it, and Lena would call it a gatto. Yeah, so gatto is like the French word in yeah. in Italian. They 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 write it G A T T O, and um, that's a more common name from Arezzo. And um, um, you know, even this cake, this cake is somehow has made it across to America it's made it across to Australia as well and in various places it's known as an Italian rum cake where I think they must have replaced the alchemist with rum which was easier you know to find mm. and um, and in Australia it's just called um, a continental cake yeah yeah <laughs> and uh, it's sold in Italian you know Italian shops yeah, and delis for, yeah for the for the immigrants the people yes. who want that that taste of home yes exactly your third food moment is is another wobbly one. Uh, tell us about this. So the the latte la portoghese um, has a has a sort of it sounds misleading because portoghese means Portuguese and it, and latte means milk. So it's like a, um, a Portuguese milk. Which if you were just to think you know read it off a menu like that, you you'd probably not be sure what you were going to be ordering. Um, but it's actually a baked custard. It's very similar to a creme caramel, except it doesn't have cream in it. It's just milk. So that's where the milk bit comes mm. comes from. And um, it's supposedly named for some Portuguese guests that were visiting the Medici. That's the story that I've, I've read, but I'm not actually sure that that is historically correct. Um, but it is a really simple, really homely kind of dessert. Uh, I really love it. It's, it's just It's just so, so, so simple. And you can... I pretty much always have these ingredients on hand. So it's just eggs and milk and sugar and vanilla. So it's just so it's kind of so, like the so Portuguese easy. nata, but without the pastry. Without the pastry. Yeah. Yeah. So you make the you make a caramel that you put in the bottom of the pan and then you make the custard and just and bake that. Delicious. It's really lovely. Delicious. And you yeah. chose this because this is one of your favorites or because it has a particular kind of resonance? Uh, It's just one of my favourite things to eat. And even my husband, who is a famously non-dessert person, he can't stop eating this when when I've made it. So it's a a good one. It's a really good one. And I think it's just it's one of those desserts that 
that reminds, at least Tuscans, it reminds Tuscans of their grandmothers. It's a very sort of homely type of dessert. And um, like for me, actually, it's quite, it's quite like exciting and luscious. And I don't know, I, I, for me, it's not something that any of my grandmothers ever made. So I don't have that. But it's funny to see when I do make this and give it to people that they, they just, they get very, very nostalgic when, yeah, as soon as they taste it. Because it's quite a childish dessert yes. isn't it it's i think custard is very much a, a nostalgic kind of childhood food as is budini di riso well actually so rice pudding is for me one of those childhood memories is budini yes. di riso uh, a childhood food so the budini di riso are actually a pastry that you would find in um every single florentine pastry shop and um it's basically a rice pudding i mean tuscans have a lot of rice to rice desserts a lot so that they'll do like a baked rice pudding um, and they have uh, like a rice uh, cake as well um, that's almost like a mixture between a creme caramel and a, and a rice pudding. It's baked but it sort of separates into into a layer of custard and a layer of the, the baked rice. So there's there are a lot of these rice desserts um, going around in Tuscany and um, this budino di riso, though, is is particularly Florentine, um, and it is my mother in law's favorite um, favorite breakfast. So, for example, we lived for six months in southern Tuscany um, in Monte Argentario, and I remember taking her to the bar the first first time she came to visit us there, and she was looking for the budino di riso <laughs> on offer in the counter, you know. <laughs> I said, no, 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 you can't get that here. We're, we're two hours away from Florence. You know, you're not going to find that here. You only find it really in and around Florence. So, so it is like the mark of a, of a Florentine pastry shop is the Budino Riviso. And it's just a little pastry base with the rice pudding inside and they're baked. And, you know, I think when you find a good one, that's a, that's a good example of a really good pastry shop because it's kind of a nice balance of textures and sweetness and delicious go on give us your best pastry shop for the time that we can finally go back to florence so i really love um a pastry shop called dolci e dolcezze and it's slightly out of the center of florence but it's very close to my favorite market which is the sant'ambrogio market it's a tiny tiny shop maybe only a handful of people will fit in there at a time so probably if if we are still social distancing there will be like two people in there at once <laughs> and that's it but it's it's wonderful the pastries are very very good well how are the italian markets which are so bustling so full of people how is anyone social distancing at the moment i mean what what does italian life look like in in lockdown uh it's very interesting actually because um italians are famously not good at um giving personal space (laughs) (laughs) especially when you know crowded around a market or um trying to get you know pay get the attention of um you know the deli guy or something like that um but um what they're doing now is making people line up and keeping keeping a distance they're putting sort of ropes and barriers around so that um you know so that there's a, a place to be standing orderly in line it's um it's rather nice actually because usually you'd have you know people elbowing you and you're jostle, jostling for a space um just to try and and you know order your parmesan or get your prosciutto <laughs> sliced and uh, i mean so many places already had a system especially when they get very busy where where you have a number so you pull a number when you walk in and you've got the little number and then they call call you out but there are other places that um that don't do that system so it's been really interesting to see people um complying so so well with this new new system of um you know waiting in line being very patient waiting outside um you know just just waiting and not not being too bothered about having to rush through or um you know be be crowded you know close together it won't last i'm wondering because we know it won't because you've already said that nothing changes. Yes, <laughs> we've been talking about this with some <laughs> friends. We, we, we were saying we were really enjoying how, like, it is actually quite nice to have your space and have, you know, everyone being so orderly and patient. But yeah, it's quite possible that it won't last. <laughs> Well, we can't wait to get back. And in the meantime, we'll just have to cook it up and smell it and dream of Florence. Emiko, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks for listening to Cooking the Books. You can buy La Torta de la Nana and any of the books on the show by clicking on the bookshop tab at julysmith.com. And I'll be back next week with activist chef Ollie Hunter and his invitation to join the Greener Revolution. 